Imagine zooming across the Wild West on a high-speed train. You watch cattle grazing and cowboys wrangling their herd. You get off the train in LA for a bite to eat before hopping back on board and cruising along the West Coast to Seattle for a great cup of coffee and a beautiful sunset. You do all this in comfort without waiting in long lines at an airport or cramming into a compact car for what feels like an eternity. Unfortunately, this option doesn't currently exist in the United States and isn't likely to in the near future. The US may be a leader in technological innovation and an economic powerhouse, but it's almost dead last when it comes to countries with high-speed rails. How could a nation that is so wealthy be so far behind in basic railway infrastructure? Like many problems that the US is currently dealing with, some of it has to do with politics. However, there are several other issues that can give even the biggest train enthusiast a headache. Let's examine why the United States doesn't have a high-speed train network, what is keeping it from building one, and how the US can fix its current failures in railway infrastructure. Generally, most engineers require that a train be able to travel faster than 125 miles per hour to be considered a high-speed train. This speed doesn't need to be maintained for the entire trip, but it should be able to reach these speeds for most of it. The crazy thing is that high-speed trains are not a new technology. Japan's first high-speed rail was constructed in the 1960s, which means the United States is still decades behind where Japan was over 50 years ago when it comes to high-speed rails. Right now, a web of high-speed trains allow passengers easy access to almost every major city in Europe. That being said, the United States is much larger and less densely populated than Europe. But the fact that millions of people can just hop on a high-speed rail every day and zip across the landscape is something that the United States should have tried to do within its own borders a long time ago. You could theoretically get across the country by flying, however, there are some major benefits to taking a high-speed train. It might sound unbelievable, but it's oftentimes much cheaper to fly to your destination than to take a train in the US. That is, if a train even services the city you're trying to get to. Many major cities in the middle of the country are not connected by any form of railway at all, so the only way to get there is by plane or car. But cheap flights come at a great cost. Airplanes produce huge amounts of pollution that end up in our atmosphere. In fact, some data suggests that planes release around 100 times more greenhouse gas into the atmosphere than trains do. New technologies like maglev trains that run on magnets or conventional trains that run off the electric grid don't release CO2 at all. And if the electricity that powers them comes from renewable energy, these modes of transportation eliminate greenhouse gas emissions almost entirely. The fact that most plane flights between two cities are cheaper than a train ride is partly an illusion. The United States hugely subsidizes oil and gas, so the price you're paying for a plane ticket isn't really what it should be. If airlines were required to pay the actual price for fuel, no one would be able to afford a plane ticket as it would be too expensive to fly. And since the United States stopped seriously investing in railways a long time ago, taking the train itself has become more expensive due to a lack of demand and limited services. What it comes down to is that the railway system in the United States is a big mess and needs a lot of work to bring it up to the modern standards that have been reached in Europe, China, and Japan. So how did we get here? And what are the actual problems standing in the way of the United States building an affordable high-speed rail network? If the United States ever hopes to reach its goal of achieving net zero emissions by 2050, affordable high-speed rail transport is a must. There's no other way to carry large numbers of people long distances quickly with low greenhouse gas emissions. You can only cram so many people onto an airplane, while a train can increase or decrease the number of passengers and its weight by adding or subtracting cars. Planes will never be able to transport as many passengers as high-speed trains, which gives them a huge advantage. Moreover, by using renewable energy to power high-speed trains, their emissions can be reduced almost to zero. Some trains will still need to run on fossil fuels, but this is offset by the sheer number of passengers they can carry. Unfortunately, 2050 is about 25 years away, meaning the US doesn't have a long time to build a high-speed rail network that connects the entire country and offsets carbon emissions. However, before the United States can even begin to consider transitioning to high-speed rails, there are some very big problems that need to be overcome. The most obvious obstacles are costs and logistics. The US can't just buy high-speed trains and throw them onto the existing tracks in the country or the lack thereof. The already existing tracks and signals are so outdated, they'd need to be upgraded to handle high-speed trains. On top of that, certain routes are just not viable for high-speed train travel as the landscape and curvature of the track would not allow the train to reach over 125 miles per hour, which defeats the point of using high-speed trains. In order to fix the already existing problems with the US railway system and build new tracks to support high-speed trains, the government must purchase resources, land, and pay workers a fair wage. The sad part is the United States invests less in its own infrastructure than any other developed country in the world. 
Over 16% of the annual budget goes to the military, with over 50% of discretionary funds being allocated to the armed forces each year. If the US spent as much money on infrastructure as it did on its military, there would be enough money to build a high-speed train network while also improving the transportation methods already in service. However, that's not the priority of the government as of right now. The reimagining of the United States railway system to support high-speed trains will cost billions and billions of dollars. All that money has to come from somewhere, and sadly, many politicians in the federal and state government don't think that such a project is worth it. This brings us to the biggest obstacle that a high-speed train network needs to overcome before it can be built in the United States – politics. If you've been following US politics for the last few years, you know that it's a very divided country with two main political parties that refuse to get along. However, the debate around high-speed trains and railroads in general has been happening for decades in the United States. The auto industry is a huge force to be reckoned with in the country, and there are definitely politicians influenced by the power and money that car companies have. But this isn't the main issue. What it really comes down to is that the federal government is the only one who can draw up a high-speed railway plan and fund it. However, the battle surrounding state rights has stood in the way of constructing a high-speed train network ever since the idea was first proposed. In order to build a railway network that could connect cities across state lines, the federal government would need to step in. Unfortunately, every time the federal government tries to come up with a plan for an interstate railway, they get pushback from certain states that believe it's overstepping its role. The problem is exacerbated by the fact that no matter which presidency tries to start a high-speed rail project, it never comes to fruition due to the necessity to conduct long studies, which oftentimes aren't completed until a newly elected official is in office. At this point, the proposed plan of the original administration is scrapped and the new leadership either has no interest in creating a new one or they just start all over again. This has led to a series of promises around high-speed rails that have not been kept. No one's arguing against impact studies being conducted and consulting experts before a high-speed rail system is built, but if every administration starts from square one when they're elected to office, there's zero chance that the United States will ever start connecting its cities by high-speed trains. A perfect example of this happened in 2009 with President Obama's administration. During this time, they proposed building a high-speed rail network in different parts of the country. Unfortunately, the map and plan presented were incredibly vague and had several inconsistencies. It never became clear how certain cities would be connected as there were gaps in the tracks. It also stated that some railways would have a max speed of 250 miles per hour, while others would only be able to be used at 90 miles per hour without any clear reason as to why. But perhaps the biggest problem was that many of the states the railways would pass through had zero experience in building railways in the past. There would need to be a lot of oversight from the federal government, which is a hard sell. In the end, the proposed plan left more questions than it answered, which inevitably led to it falling apart and no longer progress being made on a high-speed rail front. But this was not the first plan to lack the necessary time, money, and effort to make a high-speed train network a reality. Time and time again, administrations brought up plans to build up the nation's railway infrastructure, and yet it never gets done because there isn't enough support and not enough people see it as being important. The real problem in the United States isn't that the government can't allocate the money and resources needed to build a high-speed train network, it's simply that it has no interest in doing so. Most citizens have never had access to trains, so there isn't any outcry by voters to improve our current railway system or build a high-speed network. Without any pressure from constituents, elected officials feel no need to push for high-speed rails to be built. Another major problem is that US citizens just don't trust the government to do what it says it'll do. Although there are many differences, an interstate high-speed railway could be comparable to the interstate highway system that was designed under the Eisenhower administration in the 1950s and built in the decades that followed. When you look at a roadmap of the United States, it's clear that a lot of time, planning, and money went into the interstate highway system. The same process could be used to implement a high-speed rail network if things were the same as they were in the 50s. When the interstate highway system was proposed and accepted, 70% of the country trusted the federal government and supported its decisions. That trust has declined to around 43% in recent years. What this means is that even if the federal government does come up with a solid plan to build a high-speed rail network that's well thought out and cost-effective, the majority of the country might not trust them to do what they say they will. This means that until the government regains the trust of the people, it'll not be able to secure funding and complete any long-term projects, including building a high-speed rail network. This is all extremely frustrating for the many people who want to see a high-speed train network built throughout the country to allow for travel that has less impact on the planet while giving the general public a cheaper alternative to flying or driving. But until the masses push for high-speed rails to be built, 
or the politicians in power have a change of heart, the United States will continue falling behind in the public transportation sector. On top of the politics surrounding high-speed trains, there are several general problems that the United States needs to overcome before construction can even begin. The transition to high-speed rails would need to happen in stages. Already existing freight railroads could be used to provide more people with access to trains and allow them to transition from a drive-everywhere lifestyle to a riding-in-a-train-from-time-to-time lifestyle. However, almost immediately this plan runs into problems. Chicago and St. Louis have been experimenting with the idea of connecting the two cities via railway to provide a more economical way to get between the two cities. In order to do this, passenger trains were set up to travel along the existing tracks used by freight trains. These tracks already followed routes with few road crossings and allowed trains to travel between 90 and 110 miles per hour. This would be an excellent transition for passengers looking to use trains more often, especially if high-speed rails eventually came to the area. The problem is, the freight trains still use the tracks, and since they carry huge amounts of materials, they don't go very fast. The passenger trains often get stuck behind the freight trains, which leads to long delays and makes traveling by railroad unappealing for most people. To make matters worse, freight companies run the tracks, so even though they're supposed to prioritize passenger trains by law, this rarely happens. What this means is that the passenger trains that are supposed to be averaging 90 miles an hour are only averaging 53 miles per hour because of delays. Therefore, taking the train is even slower than driving, which is not appealing to anyone trying to make the trip. If the passenger trains had priority and could average 70 miles per hour, this alternative would be both faster and cheaper than driving, but since so little importance is put on train infrastructure by the government, this is not a viable option yet. Even if you put all the political issues, money, and shortcomings aside, there is one major problem that the US must overcome if a network of high-speed rails is ever going to be built. When the interstate highway system was constructed, thousands of people were displaced from their homes as the government bought up the land to turn into roads. At the time, there were around 169 million people living in the United States. Today, that number has doubled to around 330 million. This means that if new railways are going to be built to connect major cities to each other, the federal government will need to buy land from private owners to complete certain routes. When the highway system was built, the government forced people to sell their homes, which is absolutely messed up. What was even more atrocious was that communities of color were often targeted and forced to sell their homes or move out of the buildings they lived in so highways could be completed. This is a whole other topic for a different video, but make no mistake, the US government did some terrible things to people in the name of so-called progress. If we fast forward 50 years to today, more and more people are now living in the suburbs surrounding major cities. It's these areas that the high-speed rail networks will need to pass through in order to get to their destination. It's estimated that tens of thousands of families will need to give up their land and houses for any sort of high-speed rail to be built. This will likely never happen, and therefore high-speed trains don't seem to be in America's immediate future. However, there could be ways around the problem if the US is willing to invest more money and resources into the research and development of high-speed trains. When you look at the population density in areas of the world that have built high-speed trains, you'll notice a stark difference between them and the US. Places like Europe, China, and Japan have population densities that are much higher than most of the US. This is actually one of the reasons why these parts of the world invested so heavily in train networks. It's also important to note that for many, having access to a train became a major part of their lives, and entire communities grew around these routes. Therefore, large numbers of people in these countries are invested in improving train infrastructure, which resulted in the transition to high-speed rails becoming the obvious next step in the evolution of their transit systems. The United States never embraced train travel the same way. Even the northeastern United States, which has the most commuter rails and passenger trains in the country, has only built one high-speed rail from Boston to Washington, D.C. It's the sprawl of communities in the U.S. that's one of the main factors inhibiting the drive to build a high-speed train network. But there's one other key element that led to the death of the train in the US, the car. There's no denying the majority of the people living in the United States love their cars. From the time the Model T rolled off the assembly line to current electric vehicles, cars have always been a huge part of American culture. Most people rely on cars to get to work, visit friends, and even go on the great American road trip. Perhaps there's no better example of how much the United States favors cars than the interstate highway system. In the 1950s, the government could have come up with an interstate railroad system, but it wasn't in the cards due to the fact that the car manufacturers realized how much money they could make by creating a car-dependent society. This led to intense lobbying that eventually resulted in the US government pouring money into the construction of roads and highways. People living in the suburbs with their families had little interest in hopping aboard a crowded train to get to work 
when they could just drive their brand new shiny Chevy to the office. The availability of cars led to more sprawl and more people living in the suburbs. It was and still is a negative feedback loop. People want to live in the suburbs, so they need a car. People have a car, which allows them to live in the suburbs. If the United States developed in a way where most people couldn't afford or have access to or just didn't need cars, it's a high probability that more railways would have been built to allow them to get from place to place. This would have resulted in a railroad network that could have eventually been upgraded to high-speed rails, similar to what many countries in Europe have been doing for the past several years. However, that's not how US history played out, and the obsession with owning a car or living in the suburbs only grew, which is exactly why the number of roads and highways also grew. In hindsight, this might have not been the best decision for the country as we now face a climate crisis as a result of burning fossil fuels. Make no mistake, the average carbon footprint of someone living in the US is much higher than parts of the world where both high-speed and traditional train systems are widely used, except for China. But the government is also partly to blame. It may be unpopular, but there is a way for the US to transition from being a car-centric culture to being more train-friendly. If the United States rebudgeted the money spent on infrastructure and directed more funds toward improving public transport, it would be an excellent step in the right direction. Rather than funding massive highway projects, the US could use that money to build more bike lanes and bus routes, both of which could lead to newly constructed high-speed train stations. Also, urban planning will need to shift to make US suburbs more walkable so residents have access to public transportation and the things they need without having to hop in their cars to get there. In many countries, there are high taxes put on owning a car. For example, in Singapore, anyone who purchases a car must pay a 150% registration tax on top of the purchasing price. This lowers the demand for cars and means more people advocate for alternative travel methods such as high-speed trains. And Singapore isn't the only country to heavily tax cars. Many countries in Europe place high taxes on owning a vehicle, and practically no other country subsidizes automobiles or gas at the same rate the US does. If the United States decided to increase the taxes for owning a car, this influx of money could be used to build an affordable high-speed rail system to carry its citizens across the country. At the same time, people would stop purchasing cars and start using public transportation more frequently. However, as things are now, Americans would rather go to war than ever let this happen. The US citizens have come to love their cars and the freedom they provide. Therefore, the US government's only option is to make high-speed trains more appealing than traveling by car. This means the cost for riders must be low and travel times must be shorter than driving. All of these problems seem insurmountable, and that's probably because they are. Until there's a shift in the mentality of most Americans, cars will reign supreme, and the government will have no incentive to change the country's current infrastructure. At some point, however, they may not have a choice. As urban centers grow and people become more conscious of their environmental impact, they may look for more sustainable travel methods. Perhaps in the future, this will lead to a growth in high-speed rails. The question then becomes, how should the US go about building a high-speed rail network? As we mentioned before, there are problems with using existing railways, such as sharing them with slow freight trains. Building brand new tracks could displace people and lead to court cases that last years, essentially gridlocking the high-speed rail building process. Unfortunately, there isn't a really single good option. The United States could try to fix or update the tracks that have already been used by installing more switches to allow high-speed trains to pass freight trains, but this will take time and money. Also, there needs to be an agreement between the government and the owners of the freight tracks, which could lead to even more delays, as these two entities don't always get along. Constructing a high-speed train network will take time and will likely need to be done in phases. Perhaps the US could build new tracks connecting growing cities to existing tracks to save on costs and avoid as much land purchasing as possible. Other tracks might need to be built out of necessity, such as one that connects New York City to Chicago. Seems like an obvious choice for a high-speed rail as current train passengers must stop in Buffalo and Cleveland before reaching Chicago, a trip that takes around 19 hours on a good day. You can see why a two and a half hour flight is much more appealing, even if it's bad for the environment. However, a direct route between the two cities using a high-speed rail could have you arriving in around six hours, which, if affordable, could be an option for many people. In terms of getting around the problem of land rights, the United States might need to invest in tunneling technology that will allow high-speed trains to travel underneath towns or in areas where the land on the surface cannot be procured. This is a much better option than trying to go over or plow through protected or private lands. There are several companies working toward better tunneling technology, but we still have a long way to go. Technology is always advancing, and the longer the United States waits to invest in high-speed trains, the further behind it'll be in developing sustainable forms of mass transportation and long-distance commuting. It'll no longer be an option as the population grows and more people move to urban centers for jobs. As it stands right now, high-speed trains will not be coming to the United States anytime soon. 
In fact, it seems like the country is doubling down on cars by investing heavily in electronic charging stations and giving automakers tax breaks. Perhaps the future of mass transit in the United States is self-driving electric buses that use the already constructed interstate highway system to move people from place to place in a sustainable way. However, this will never be as fast as high-speed rails, which may cause some Americans to wonder why their country can't match the comfort or speed of the high-speed trains zipping around Europe and Asia. Now watch why the United States won't win World War III, or check out Japanese train pushers and other crazy strange jobs.